Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Pastor Jung here at Faith Lutheran Church in Park, California. And uh, God's blessings to you this day as we uh, continue on with our study in the book of Ephesians. Uh, number one, thank you for joining us. And I pray that this word may go well with you. Number two, uh, if you have missed any of the Bible studies previous, uh, please go on uh, to our YouTube channel. Uh, please also go to www.faithmorepark.com, M-O-O-R-P-A-R-K.com, and uh, go there as you will see the plentiful resources uh, that are for your benefit. So please use them, sermons, uh, catechetical teachings, Bible teachings, all these different things, devotions, um, everything really. So please, <laughs> please use those uh, for your own benefit. I always encourage people to just uh, turn it on, listen to it, um, and rejoice in the Word. Uh, what a great gift this is. Uh, but today, today especially, um, we are going through verses, Ephesians uh, chapter 2, uh, verses 19, to also chapter 3, probably to 1 and also 2. So Ephesians 2 to 3, from 19 to, to also, I'm <laughs> being so complicated here, uh, to chapter 3, verse 1 or 2. So you'll get it. Anyways, uh, why don't we begin? Why don't we begin with a word of prayer as we study the Bible? And this prayer, of course, comes out of your hymnal. A great prayer about studying before uh, uh, with God's word. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, without your help or labor, our labor is useless, and without your light, our search is in vain. Invigorate our study of your Holy Word, that by the diligence and right discernment we may establish ourselves and others in your holy faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. Lord, invigorate our study of your holy word by due diligence and right discernment. That's why we study the Bible, uh, for the truth, so that we may discern by the power of the Holy Spirit the truth, not what we feel, not what we think is right, but always according to the inerrant word of God. Yes, our old Adam, our flesh, fights that daily as we want the Word to be what is catered to our own sinful flesh. But no, we are here to study God's Word according to His Word. May we have this right, faithful discernment. All right. Well, God's blessing to you. Why don't we get into this? Uh, we got a really good study for you today as St. Paul continues uh, to, to show them clearly uh, yeah, what, where they once were, and now, by the grace of God, here he has brought them together, and this is the result. Verse 19, why don't we just kick in? If you have your Bible out, please, please get that out as we go here. Please look at the whiteboard as well as I take my notes here um, for you, and may this be of great benefit to you. I encourage you to take notes um, um, and um, really use these as your... Uh, future resources when you uh, go over this, go over the, the scriptures. So here, here we see in verse 19, verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Right, so this so then is a result of, right? And we see that previously throughout chapter 2, but also in verse 18, if you go back one verse, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So that access in verse 18 is Christ, and because of Christ and his atoning sacrifice upon the cross, the resulting fact is this, so then. And because of what he has done freely by his grace, you are no longer strangers and aliens, Gentiles. You are no longer outsiders. 
no longer strangers or aliens, but now to all those who received him, to those who believe in his name, you gave them the right to become children of God, John 1, 12. And here we see a similar sentiment in a sense where when we talk about uh, citizenship and when we talk about rights and we talk about uh, 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 the benefits therein in citizenship, I mean, in any citizenship, uh, you could talk about um, being a card carrying member at, at a local big box store or you, you have a membership to a local organization or or um, even being a citizen of the United States. There, there are definitely benefits to those who are citizens of the United States. Um, and uh, there are many benefits in terms of uh, what it means to no longer be a stranger and alien from God. That is no longer outside of his uh, word, but now brought together, and as a result of being brought together in Christ Jesus, the access point, which we talked about last week, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. The result is what? No longer outsiders, but you have been uh, transferred uh, from darkness uh, to marvelous light, that you are uh, a new creation. The old is gone, the new is come. Uh, and we very well know that uh, through the blood of Christ, through your baptism, the result is this. You are, what does it say right there? Fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So because of, so then, access Christ, ultimately the grace of God, his merit upon the cross given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins, Members, household of God. Again, this is not about the Old Testament covenant in a sense of uh, the chosen people. This is not about how many laws you follow in order to merit your way to heaven or, or to merit your holiness code. No, this is all outside of themselves, beyond themselves. And because of it, because of the access of Christ, now they are no longer separated, but they are in oneness and reconciled with God, Jew and Gentile. God chose no partiality. Members of the household of God. How? 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 Did they pass a test? No, it is Jesus who fulfilled that very thing for them by his grace, his humble obedience, his humiliation, exaltation, the word made flesh, right? Which reminds me, if you ever have any uh, questions about the catechism on Thursdays, every Thursday we have a live catechism uh, study. So please join us for that as well. Sorry, that's my little plug. But here we see, so then, right? So then, outsiders, now the members of household of God, all by the grace that he bestows upon each and every one of us. That you are fellow citizens with the saints, right? All by grace. Saints, you are the saints. I was going to sing the song real quick for all the saints, but I won't do that. But you are saints. You are the holy ones, right? How are you holy? Why are you a saint? Because you're covered by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Jew and Gentile, covered by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. You are part of this household by the one who has built this house, and that is our Lord, by his uh, cross being lifted high upon a tree. Three days, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Alleluia, right? Rising on the third day. So this is, uh, I think, very important. I love these little, um, uh, these little transitions that St. Paul uses because though they seem minuscule, though they seem like just a transition, it really does open up the umbrella, the broad picture of of why the floodgates that God gives to us by his bountiful grace does drastically change the identity, the status, right? And this is all status language right here. And uh, all by his blood, right? Um, so 
They are now members of, of the household of God, no longer alienated, no longer separated, but together in the oneness with God, Jew and Gentile, uh, the, the tensions uh, uh, should be uh, put on the back burner because it's all about Jesus. All right, verse 20. Verse 20. Um, it says right there, uh, So, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself, being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So, this household, right, right here, is built upon the cornerstone. Now, in any cornerstone of a building, I'm no architect, right? So please, I apologize beforehand if I, I totally mess this up. But when we talk about uh, the household of God, what makes this household, right? What makes them saints? It's all about uh, the cornerstone to which they were built upon. And that cornerstone is Jesus Matthew 16, 16, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. See, the cornerstone is very important. If the cornerstone in any building is aligned improperly, then the rest will also be aligned improperly. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, so, you know, when we talk about uh, the cornerstone, uh, it's very important that that cornerstone is perfect and right and built up correctly because it's like a domino effect. Everything else is built upon the cornerstone. And if the cornerstone is wrong, then you have a, a wrong building. If the cornerstone is false, then you have a false building. But this house as we see it right here, is built on Christ, who is the cornerstone, right? And, you know, I think this is very important uh, when speaking of any church um, in a sense of uh, what we believe, teach, and confess is what are we built on? You know, are we built on a certain model, a certain technique? Are we built on... Um, uh, you know, a certain way we do things? Are we built on programs? Are we built on uh, the, the beautiful architectural structure of the building, which is always lovely? I love seeing good architecture, especially in churches. But what are we built on? Are we built on the pastor, right? His, his let's say, engaging personality. Are we built on, um, yeah, are we, are we built on, you know, there, I guess my point is there's so many reasons why or why people perceive the church in its way. And for us, as especially as Lutherans, right? Especially as Lutherans, we, we very well know that we are built on Christ. Everything is about Christ. It's not about uh, anything else, not even the pastor, right? It's about the Word of God and what He bestows upon us by that very Word through the pastor. And those very words are Luke 24, 44 to 47, to preach repentance and forgiveness. And at the end of the day, to preach what is the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. Not a how to be a better disciple or how to uh, merit your way or how to uh, uh, earn or, or cleanse or prove your worth to God. No. At the end of the day, it's all about for you. And this is the word that St. Paul preached Christ and in him crucified. And also for us in this day and age, we are built upon the apostles' teachings. And that brings me always back to that catechetical moment, right? Built upon the cornerstone, built upon the prophets and the, uh, the apostles' teachings. And, and again, this is our moment where we can go back to the apostles' creed, right? Um, I, I always encourage people, and if you don't make this a fine exercise or faithful exercise, I encourage you to begin now, is to recite the creed every day. Every day. Um, and, and if you haven't memorized it, don't. Don't memorize it, right? Just continue to say the very words to which we believe. Because the Apostles' Creed is a summation of, of who our Lord is. Creative uh, creation, redemption, sanctification, right? Uh, 
first, second, third article of the creed. And, and therefore, when we say these words time and time again, as my children do every day, I know they, they never memorized it, but rather it just became a part of them after day, after day repetition. But at the end of the day, the point is this, is that we always, as we confess the creed, get back to who we are under the household of God, by the one who has uh, given to us the foundation, the blood of Christ, the creative power, the, the sanctified life, how we are made holy. This is what our Lord does for us. And there in the creed, the apostles' teachings, though the creed wasn't made by the apostles, but is based on the apostles' teachings, we very well know that there we are back under his care because we very well know our sinful flesh, how we can be distracted or how we can... Um, uh, uh, major in the minors and, and, and really, and really uh, get distracted by the things of this world. So it's very important when we talk about the cornerstone, right? What is the cornerstone of the church? Um, and it's Christ. It'll always be Christ, right? Uh, we, you know, it, it's, it's like when a castle is made of sand, it will sink into the sea eventually, right? It's a Jimi Hendrix uh, song right there, if you like Jimi Hendrix. Anyways, uh, but the point is, uh, castles made of sand. Yeah, that's right. Uh, will sink into the sea. That's right. Uh, so, so here we see, uh, again, uh, when we talk about our cornerstone, Matthew 16, 16, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that Jesus, you will name him Jesus, for he will save people from their sin, but also uh, you are the Christ, Christos, which means in Greek, the anointed one, set apart, set apart, the true prophet, priest, high priest, and true king, right? See that he is the true priest. Your Old Testament uh, priests were anointed set apart to do the very work of God. Now, ultimately, this pointed to, like the tabernacle, it's always about Jesus, if you really look into it. Uh, ultimately, Jesus is the one who is the true priest, the one who actually sets himself into the wrath of God, taking upon that cup so that we may be forgiven, set apart to do the very mission of God, and that is to save us from sin, death, and the power of the devil all by way of the gospel. So when we speak of the cornerstone, this is what we are built upon, the understanding that Jesus is the Christ. Now, why is that important? Because once we get Jesus wrong, once we start putting Jesus as, let's say, a guru or a coach or, or someone that we must simply emulate, um, and again, we're called to be imitators of Christ, as St. Paul says, but not for the sake of meriting our salvation, right? but rather our cornerstone is on his work. Our cornerstone is on who he is in his identity, for it is by his identity that this household is built, so then you are members and saints of the household of God. Don't you see? The, our understanding of Christ is very important. If we even add even a, mo even a, a little sprinkle of ourselves in this cornerstone, this is wrongly aligned. This will not turn out well, right? And, and that's why I always urge people, if, if you are hearing a different gospel, if you are hearing false teaching, it, it might look like a beautiful place. It might look like um, everything is built well and everything looks intact. But if the word of God isn't the cornerstone, that is the whole word of God, the whole word of God, the law and the gospel at the end of the day prevailing in Jesus Christ, then if it's not, that's when you raise the flag and say, wait, pump the brakes. What is going on here? Right? Again, what we are built upon is very important, and that is a confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right? All right. So, um, as we continue here, um, 
Indeed, Christ plays the pivotal role. Um, he is the building. He is the starting point. He, he is the ending point. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And as a result, verse 21, as we read it, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Right? The holy temple. What does this bring up, uh, should bring up in your mind? Uh, remember when Jesus was with the, the whips and cords and, and he was... Um, um, overthrowing or overturning the tables and the money changers in the temple courts, uh, he says, uh, I destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. Right? He is uh, the new temple. Right? He is the holy temple. He is uh, the restoration, uh, the new way, the only way. Uh, and that is uh, the proclamation of his truth. <clears throat> Of his gospel. And, and here we see uh, in verse 21, in whom the whole structure being joined together, right, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Now, when we talk about growing together, you know, with the context of the Jew and Gentile, you know, we know that St. Paul was under house arrest, uh, as it says in Acts, uh, what is it, Acts 22, you know, he was preaching the gospel, he was preaching uh, this gospel to the, you know, God chose no partiality. Uh, and and this, this created a lot of schism, a lot of division, a lot of strife. He also allowed um, uh, Trophimus the Ephesian into the temple courts, which also got St. Paul in hot water. So when we talk about being under arrest, that's where he was for the sake of the gospel, St. Paul was. But uh, as he is writing this letter, um, he reminds them that... I don't know why I brought that up, by the way. <laughs> I forgot what I was saying. But being joined together as they grow in the temple of the Lord. Now, when we talk about growing together, um, oh, that's right. When we talk about growing together, uh, what does that look like? Uh, you know, is it, is it because we all like donut hour? <laughs> or is it because we, we're all into the casseroles, you know, in our, in our uh, potlucks? Or is it because we just have a lot of things in common? Um, on a worldly way, or we just get along because our personalities fit. Now, again, what joins us together is the Word of God. What joins us together is the truth of God's Word as we grow in the holy temple of the Lord, right? That is our true oneness, and that oneness is the same oneness that has brought us into His kingdom all by the blood of Christ, right? So when we talk about um, church division, when we talk about tensions, let's say, in the body of Christ, um, of course, there's always the prevailing answer, remedy of Jesus, right? But I think when we have those long-lasting divisions, it's those two parties that have probably failed in some way, shape, or form in their flesh to take their eyes off what it means to be built together right? Uh, what it means to be united. Um, and that is the forgiveness of sins. That is Jesus. That is the cornerstone. See, it, it all goes back. So then, we are members of the household of God. You look at your fellow members, you look at your uh, 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 people at church on this Sunday, and you say, yes, they are, they are here like me um, to receive the forgiveness of sins, to receive the gifts, because we're all in the same boat, Jew and Gentile. Back then, and now in this day and age, we're all in the same boat in a sense where we are all members by the all-encompassing work of Christ and the cross. All right. So, verse 22. In Him, in Him you are being built together. Baptismal language in Him. How are you in Christ? Right? By the gift of of your baptism in the triune name of our Lord. And there you are being built together. Similarly to what I just said earlier about being built together um, in Christ Jesus. But here, uh, the Holy Spirit, right? By the Holy Spirit, we are built together um, through the word and the sacraments. Right? That by the Spirit who calls, gathers, and enlightens us 
and keeps us in the true faith, right? Who aligns us with his very gifts, and those very gifts are the sacraments. And there we are brought to faith, being built together as living stones. Uh, I think that's 2 Peter. And uh, there we, uh, what does it say? Oh, 1 Peter, sorry. As living stones, and, and therefore, as we are uh, uh, his children under his grace, uh, they, there we are by his very word, continuing to be built together in his name, right? And that is very important because at the end of the day, when we speak of being built together, it's our proper understanding and ultimate faith that is in Christ Jesus, right? That is how we are built together, in the words of Christ. Like, do you believe in the living an efficacious work of our Lord? Do you believe that his word actually works? Do you believe that God's promise is actually uh, that he says or he does what he says by those very words? That's the thing. We're not bringing any innovation here to the word of God, right? Because there need, there, there need not be any innovation because his word is all that we need. There's nothing further from what his word gives to us. And here, as we read it, in him you also are being built together. Right? Jesus. I mean, that's the thing. Right? Um, that's why we are who we are as, as a body of Christ. Because Christ is our cornerstone. Once we deviate from this, we have a whole different monster at hand. And um, here we see again uh, about the importance of being built together, that this understanding of how we are built together is very important, and that is by His very Word, by the Spirit who creates and sustains faith in us. That faith is Christ. The Word is Christ. The work of the Holy Spirit is what? To comfort, first convict us of our sin. Convict us of our sin, and comfort us in the righteousness of Christ, right? So uh, when we talk about being built together, you know, it is of that forgiveness that we are, as we hear it and receive it, the words of Christ. We're there as a church. We are constantly being built together by the cornerstone that is the very foundation to which we stand in terms of our salvation, in terms of our membership in his household, in terms of being called the saints, no longer aliens or strangers, but by the grace of God, by his access point of the cross, there we have the cornerstone, the confession of St. Peter, Matthew 16, 16, and there in the temple of this uh, temple of the Lord, we are being built together in him. Right? So, so this so then really is the Result, and we see that result of what it means to be built up together, what it looks like in the holy temple of the Lord, all because of so then. And we see right here as we go to our last verse, uh, as we will talk about today, um, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, if you could read it there, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. For this reason, that is because of chapter two, all that was said in chapter two by grace, right? You are saved through faith. This is not your own doing, but a gift from God. For this reason, all that he had just said, because of this, what does it say? It says, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ. Prisoner. Now again, he's literally a prisoner in this world under house arrest, right? But at the same time, he is a prisoner of Christ. That he is, I think someone said, under the custody of the Lord. That he is under the care of the Christ. That ever since he was called on that Damascus road, there he was also called to be the chosen instrument to proclaim uh, the gospel to all nations. And there he is a prisoner of Christ. Right? 
And that, you know, when we talk about prisoner, uh, that brings up a very uh, conflicting thought, doesn't it? In a sense where when we speak of prisoner, um, uh, we very well know that, uh, what is it? Uh, that this is a negative connotation, like being bound, being uh, uh, behind bars, uh, being constricted, being confined. Um, and, and that's so paradoxical, right? Like our old Adam desires nothing of being bound. Like our old Adam just does not want to be confined. I mean, a lot of people would say, well, I don't, I'm not Christian because I don't want to follow any rules or I don't like those Ten Commandments or it's too confining. I mean, you hear this as a common sentiment. But remember what it means to be under the household of God. And remember what it means to be under the care of the Lord. Right? Yes, we are called to submit to God's word. We are called uh, to follow his word, his demands, the law, the Ten Commandments. Yes, we struggle with those very things. We fall short, right? But we know what his word says. And when we do fall short, we have that contrition. We have that sorrow. But yet at the same time, we repent and confess. And there we know the Lord is faithful and just. He will forgive us of all of our unrighteousness, right? So when we speak of being a prisoner, in the case of being a prisoner of Christ, this is a good thing. Because no one can separate us from what? As a prisoner to Christ, from his love. No height, nor depth, nor angels, nor demons. Nothing can separate us, Romans 8. We always read that one at a, usually at a funeral sermon, right? Uh, or a funeral text, because it's so true. This is what it means to be with God. Right? To be under his care, to be under his uh, guardianship. And because of this, even though he had faced much tribulation as a proclaimer of the Christians, it says right there, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner, for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. Again, status, circumstance. And also St. Paul is really setting up the reason why or the, uh, the call that he has to preach this very word to the Gentiles, right? Because by his status, by his circumstance, by the reality that he has been uh, brought into, right? Um brought into Christ, that they should not be discouraged that he is under house arrest. That they should, the Gentiles should continue uh, to, to continue, right? Uh, to continue knowing full well that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And again, it, it is by that uh, though he was a prisoner, he continued to serve as a prisoner of Christ. That is, under his grace, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, as the workmanship of God prepared for good work in Christ Jesus. All right. So, we'll conclude this day with verse 2. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. Again, he, what is he saying right here? The oikonomian, right? That this house manager, this, this one who keeps everything together. He is showing the Gentiles that though he is under arrest, he is a prisoner of Christ, and he was called to do this very thing, to be a mouthpiece, to give them the very word, to be that steward under the head honcho, the Lord, Right? And there he is reminding them of the credibility that he has under God's name. He's not preaching a different gospel. He's not preaching a different word. He's simply a mouthpiece as a chosen instrument, Acts chapter 9. Um, and he is simply being the dispenser of God's grace, and that is his very word. Again, he is reminding them, do not be discouraged, my friends. God's word the household, what we are built on, and that cornerstone, that is what we preach, Christ and in Him crucified. 
right? And this is the call. It says right there, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. St. Saint, Saint Paul was, was called to preach to them the law and the gospel. Ultimately, the grace by his authority that was given to him by the Lord, not to lord it over them, but to give them the very word. He was there for them for this very reason. Let's just see. For this reason, Ephesians 2, his call on the Damascus Road all by way of the gospel, formerly a persecutor of Christians, right? Remember that, right? He was going to Damascus to imprison more Christians, right? And, uh, and, and here we see the same, that because of this reason, so then the result is, and therefore, as all these dominoes fell by the will of God and plan of God, he is there to teach them for them, all by God's will, and that is Christ. Never about Paul, always about Christ. Paul was simply there to preach the Christ and in him crucified. Paul was simply there to boldly preach what was outside of himself, and that is the gospel, that is the sacraments, that is the comfort and care the Lord brings, all by way of his blood. And this is what the house is built on, right? Again, why is this so important, friends? Because once we misunderstand or deviate from the cornerstone, we are preaching something else. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. But because of this reason, because of the gospel, here St. Paul is encouraging them, writing this letter to them, and giving them the peace that this world cannot give. Right? So no matter the tension, the household is built not on uh, the way of man, but on the way of God, and that is his cornerstone. And because of it all, we see St. Paul continuing to endure. Because of it all, uh, it's by that very powerful living word that he continues to preach and teach because, well, he is a prisoner of Christ, and that is a good thing. Right? And that's the conflict, I think, a lot of times, I, honestly, with our sinful flesh. You know, we want to be autonomous, we want to be independent, but at the end of the day, when we go on that route, we know that it never ends well, you know? Um, uh, but when we are in the Word of God, we know the Word of God. It stings us, right? Uh, we know when we fall short, and we have that contrition, we have that sorrow, but at the same time, it is our Lord who gets us back to Jesus, the cross, the empty tomb, our baptism, where there we find a comforted conscience, a blessed soul, a purified, um, uh, purified of our sins, knowing full well that we are in the household of God. Because our King is the one who conquered the world and who gives us life everlasting. All right, we'll stop there. Um, why, don't we, uh, why don't we close uh, with a word of prayer? In one voice, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Uh, God's blessings to you this day, and I hope that this word uh, went well with you. Um, and thank you for joining us today. But until next time, love you all, praying for you all. And if you ever need anything, just let me know. I'm always here for you. All right. Well, have a wonderful day. And until next time, adios. And goodbye.